This is the section where we have to learn the laws. So let's get there and see our first property that lets us take these derivatives much quicker. The first one we're gonna look at is that, recall that the definition of the derivative is the limit as h goes to zero of f of x plus h minus f of x over h. Well, we're gonna do one more via this definition. I promise it'll go quickly. And so we have f of x equals c, so we're having a constant function. Well, what would be the derivative of a constant function? You can think of it geometrically, but for a moment, let's not. And I'll explain in a minute why I'm not doing it that way. We'll come back to the geometry in a moment. So f of x plus h, well, it's a constant function. Doesn't matter where you are, so it's c minus c. So it's zero divided by h. Your h is approaching zero, so they will be values, not zero itself. You don't actually hit zero, and all of those values would be zero over h, so the limit would be zero in this particular case that we're interested in. Well, that actually makes sense, because if you have a constant function, then it is simply a horizontal line. What's the slope of that line? Zero. It, as we've talked about, a line is its own tangent line. So that's what we have. And that is our first law, if you will, of derivatives. The derivative of a constant function is zero. This is one of those litmus tests of someone who took calculus, is that if somebody says, I took calculus, they may have, but to see if there are things they remember. One is the limit definition of the derivative. That can have the following reaction, like that. You may have had that right there. It's perfectly fine. Welcome to the fold. The other one is the derivative of a constant. If the person goes, I can't remember, there's a lot that they're not gonna remember if they can't remember the derivative of a constant. That may not be the case for you, but truly, and not very long at all, this will be very quick and very natural. I wanna point that out because all the laws we're about to see will become very natural as you begin to do more and more problems, which is part of how you determine how many problems to do is that as you do more and more problems, you're really working toward familiarity with this, just like when you originally did arithmetic, and you would do the arithmetic in order to be very comfortable with producing them. So this is the first one that we have. So if f of x equals five, then f prime of x is, well, we have a constant function, zero. We'll just do one more, just for the sake of doing it without the limit definition of the derivative. If it equals, well, pi. Uh, it's still a number, so it's still a constant function, so f prime of x equals zero. Be a little careful with this, particularly if you take calculus somewhere where you have tests and things like that. A lot of times they'll move from just a number and put a variable like pi or e. It's about as tricky as you can possibly get on this is to change to something like that, and it's still zero. As I mentioned, this is where we're working the core. So if there was kind of a workout of calculus where you're working the core, today is the core of the derivatives. These laws are where you're really working that kind of central being, if you will, of doing calculus with derivatives are these laws. The next is called the power rule. So here, if we have a power function, which is why it's called the power rule, then the derivative of x to the n equals n of x to the n minus one. So if f of x equals x squared, for instance, then f prime of x equals, you bring this down and then you subtract one from the exponent. So I bring down the two, I repeat the variable, and then I subtract one. So two x. Let's increase the exponent. Let's try to change the name of the function, g equals x, and let's go up to the fourth. Can you see what that would be? We bring it down, so that's four x, and then four minus one, so four x cubed. Now, this would be a point in class where someone would say, do I have to write minus one? Of course not, you can do that in your head, but in the beginning, if you find you're not doing these accurately, write the minus one. Why am I always writing all of these steps? Because I've taught long enough that I know that just seeing the step kind of gets it into your system so that you do it accurately. The most important part that dictates how much do you write is how much do you need to write in order to do it accurately. 
That's how much you write in terms of the problem. Okay, so let's look at these two that we have prepared for us, which are a little more complicated than the one we were just looking at. So f of x equals x to the 5 halves power. It's the same property, so f prime of x would equal, we bring down the exponent, 5 halves x, and this is one where I myself would probably put 5 halves minus 1, just to be sure I have it, and then begin to think this arithmetic of fractions, because, I don't know, something must have happened in elementary school where I just have a concern with fractions. Actually, what it is is that I know that I'm not always accurate with fractions, is that I call it my mind relaxes. I go, oh, it's just fractions, it's arithmetic, but I know I can do it incorrectly, so I write it down just to be sure I get it correct. x, 5 halves, minus 2 halves, which equals 5 halves x to the 3 halves. And there it is. How about this one? f of x equals 1 over x to the fourth. Well, that doesn't look anything like what we were just doing. We said x to some power. Yes, but that's where I rewrite it. So I write f of x equals x to the negative 4. That's the same as we were just looking at. So I bring it down, f prime of x equals negative 4 x to the minus 4 minus 1. That says be careful all over the place because there's all kinds of nastiness that goes on when you're doing this. This is one of those moments where, again, if you make these kind of sign errors, you need to be very careful when you see it and be able to say slow down and do not let your mind relax in order to be careful. And there we have it. And just given that it was 1 over in the original case, there's something that has a certain symmetry to it, if you will, from the uh, beginning problem to the solution and writing it in this form. But either, either is equivalent, so they're both correct. So how about the constant multiple rule? So I have a constant times a function, and the constant can come out, and then I just simply take the derivative of the function itself. So for instance, if f of x equals 5x, then well, uh, let's do squared, so it's a little bit more going on there. Then if I want f prime of x, that equals 5, and I'm going to switch notation here, into d dx of x squared, and that equals 5 times 2x, which equals 10x. So that's how you're using that property. So here we have another one. So can you see where we're going to use this? So we have 6x to the fourth. All right, it's exactly the same thing that I just did. So if I'm interested in f prime of x, that equals, I bring this down, so it's 6, I bring down the 4, x cubed, which equals 24x cubed. Now notice the difference between the two. On the previous one, I actually showed that intermediary step. I actually brought out the constant and then wrote in the derivative of the interior term. That would be fine. But in the second step, I began to reflect that more of that can be done in your mind, and you just simply do the derivative immediately. So if you needed that step, you could go back to the slide and add it in, else you could move directly into the answer. In time, you probably won't even write the parentheses in what you do, but you might. It depends, again, what makes you accurate. The sum rule. This is very akin to some of the laws and rules that we we're looking at for limits. If both f and g are differentiable, then if you're looking at the derivative of the sum of the two functions, you can break them up, take the derivative of each individually, and add them together. Not surprisingly, this comes with a difference rule as well, where if you're subtracting the two functions, taking their difference, then you can break them up, take the derivative of f, and subtract the derivative of g. Well, that enables us to look at more complicated polynomials now. If I'm interested in f prime of x, then I can look at the first term, just look at the derivative of the first term. This is the power rule, so I bring down the 6, x to the 6 minus 1, which is 5, plus I'll bring down the 2 and multiply it by the 4. I'm not yet going to do that immediately. I'm still going to write an intermediary step here. 2 minus 1 is 1, minus 3, well let's talk about why I'm doing this this way. So I bring down the 1, which is 3 times 1, x to the 0, plus 0. So that gives me the derivative of each term. So 6x to the 5th, plus 8x, minus 3. 
This step in time, most, most students don't do, is because in time, 3x, you'll just go, is 3. And in this case, it's minus 3 because you're subtracting the term. So there we go. That gives us the derivative of a much more, can you imagine trying to do the limit definition for this? I mean, that's one of the ones where it's like, how much credit is on this problem? It's three points. I'm okay at starting with a 97. I mean, that's that kind of problem. But now it's like, yeah, no problem. Make it x to the hundredth. I mean, whatever that would be, you can immediately jump given the power rule. So now this is a good variation of the types of things you can begin to answer given how quickly we can do this. Find the points where the curve, this is what we just looked at, x to the sixth plus 8x squared minus 3x plus 1 has a horizontal tangent line. Okay, so what exactly does that mean? So first we have to think of, we have to actually remember what horizontal and vertical mean. And believe it or not, some, some people are like, what do you mean? Other people are like, Shoot, which one's which? The way I remember it is that the horizon is what you look out at, right? Right there, there it is. It's the horizon, it's flat. So it's flat, so what's the slope? Flat, I think of Kansas. You don't, if you skiing Kansas, it's cross country skiing because there's no slope. So it has a slope of zero. So that's what we're actually asking is when is f prime of x equal to zero? When am I going to have to cross country ski if I were to try to ski the tangent line? Okay, so f prime of x is what we just found. So it's six x to the fifth plus eight x minus three. And we're asking when does that equal zero? So in this particular case, you would actually solve this particular problem and that would give you x values such that at those x values, you had horizontal tangent lines. So that's the type of problem that you would look at in terms of that. If you have something to the fifth power, that's an example of generally you're expected to be using some type of calculator to help you solve those. Once you get up above, even cubics can be difficult. That's why we have the quadratic formula. The quadratic formula will pop it out. Cubics, there is a formula, but once you move much beyond that, it's, unless there's some little trick in there, it's usually pretty hard to figure out. But other than solving this equation, you very quickly can begin to see where you get these horizontal tangent lines. The next rule that we have is that the derivative of e to the x is e to the x. This is one of those, please give me that derivative problem. There is almost nothing to remember other than there's almost nothing to do. It just gives it right back, is that that's the derivative. This is one of the ones where sometimes if I actually think about that, it's wild. It's like I'm, the slope of the tangent line is actually the function itself. That in itself is kind of just mind boggling to me in its own way. We're now going to be able to use these rules to take derivatives. So this is also called, the name of this section could also be in terms of where we are because now we have these rather than the limit definition. So as you do these, Occasionally, think about how fast you're going and take joy in the rules that we've learned in this section. There is no reason why everyone shouldn't have access to the very best education. Welcome to Calculus One. To introduction to astronomy. The introduction to philosophy. To statistics. Microeconomics. Psychology. Let's get started.